Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of New Books Network. This is Morteza Hajizadeh, your host from Critical Theory Channel. Today, I'm very honored to be speaking with a very special guest, Dr. Huaping Lu Adler, who wrote a very wonderful book, uh, a wonderful book published by Oxford University Press. The book is called Kant, Race and Racism, Views from Somewhere. Uh, Dr. Huaping Adler is a professor of philosophy, and I'll ask you to introduce herself uh, more and tell us why she decided to write a book about Kant, race, and racism. Wapping, welcome to New Books Network. Thank you so much, Morteza. It's such a great pleasure and honor to be here. So I guess I'll just begin by saying a little bit about myself. So my name is Huaping Lu Adler. Uh, as you can tell from my name, Lu indicates my Chinese origin. So, um, so very much I wrote this book from a lot of personal experience as well. Uh, so I'm right now an associate professor of philosophy at Georgetown University, and I specialize in 17th and 18th century Western European philosophy, especially Kant. Uh, right now, I also have significant interest in history of philosophy of science, philosophy of race, and social epistemology. So let's talk about the book. Uh, well, when, when, when people talk about Kant, the idea of racism usually comes in. And there have been many articles about this, but you take a kind of a different approach. You So let's tell us why, why you decided to write this book and how is how does it approach the topic of race uh, from a different angle in, in regards to Kant? Okay, so um, maybe I'll just say uh, a little bit about how I uh, came across this topic and um, actually the way I arrived at this topic accidentally um, is also very telling about the scholarship. So it actually all began in 2019, the year after I got tenured and I was at this um, American Philosophical Association's Central Division meeting uh, that year. And there was this a session called Prejudice in Philosophy. So I was intrigued. And the panelists included uh, Charles Mills and Robert, Robert Bernasconi. And um, this con scholar, Lucy L.A., was the commentator. So I did not know at that time that all three of them wrote influential articles on Kant's racism. So I went to their session actually simply to learn about prejudices in our profession uh, more generally. But then I did not expect that Kant would become the center of the discussion. And so you see, at the time, I was completely ignorant about Kant's views on race. Um, so obviously, nobody in my limited professional circle uh, took this topic seriously enough um, to even mention it. So, um, and actually, the relevant secondary literature was in plain sight, so to speak. Um, but for whatever reason, I actually never came across it in my education or research at all. So you can imagine that I was really shocked. <laughs> when I, you know, uh, heard about his racism uh, <laughs> in such a, a serious way. So I was shocked. I was ashamed of my own ignorance. I went through a period of grief, if you may. And I was actually in a pretty serious moral and intellectual crisis. Um, but then as the cliche goes, the way uh, out, the best way out is through. So I decided to write this book, partly to guide myself through the crisis, um, you know, so that I don't get crushed, so to speak, <laughs> under its weight. Yeah, that was how the book came mm -hmm. about. Yeah. And, and you said it was in 2019, right? Yes, 2019. Yeah. And I think it's... Uh... And, you know, what we had in 2020 COVID and there was a lot of anti-Asian sentiments and prejudice. So I guess uh, exactly. it, it all kind of worked well that you, yeah. you decided to write this book. Yeah, uh, yeah. 
Yeah. Well, actually, maybe this is a good segue. The remark you just made is a good segue, you know, to the uh, the the question I haven't answered, namely, you know, what my unique approach. Yeah, yeah. Topic is, and this actually has a lot to do with my personal experience, right? So, as someone who's Asian, who had to go through this kind of anti-Asian, um, you know, how do you put it, <laughs> anti-Asian. I wouldn't say a movement, an anti-Asian tendency, um, you know, at least uh, in the U.S. Um, and I was raised uh, um, as a Buddhist, so to speak. And I'm someone who does not want to, you know, uh, so to speak, hold resentment in my heart. And I try to approach everything with a bit of radical love. And mm. one thing I always try to keep in mind is that I don't describe people by adjectives, but describe them by verbs. And I actually borrowed this from one of my students in my Chinese philosophy class, this particular way of saying. So uh, one thing that the readers would notice about my book is that I actually never once called Kant a racist. And that was a very deliberate uh, decision. It's not because I did not think that he held racist views, but for me, there is actually a big philosophical difference between calling an individual racist and saying that they held racist views. So this actually takes me to the unique approach I'm taking in this book, right? So the prevailing approach is what I call individualistic or what Charles Mills called atomistic approach, right? So according to this approach, basically uh, there is this tendency to uh, treat individuals as the only or primary subjects of blame, redemption, psychological analysis, and so on, independently of how they are socially situated. Um, so most of scholars who acknowledge that Kant held racist views tend to see these as merely personal prejudices uh, that contradict his moral theory, moreover, and they tend to interpret the supposed contradiction as a matter of cognitive dissonance on Kant's part, right? And some of these scholars are also invested in contending that, you know, Kant finally, very late in his life, changed his racist mind and did so thanks to you know, some sort of rational reckoning as proof that his theory is stronger than his prejudice. So I, um, as someone who did not grow up in a, an individualistic culture, you probably, you can probably relate, right? So the cultures we grew up in are relational, right? We That's never right. see individuals as isolated individuals. We see them as situated, as relating to others, right? As this node in the giant web of relations, right? So um, for me, um, I, in, I think for me, it's really natural for me to move away from this individualistic approach. Yeah. And I could tell the individualistic character of this approach right away as someone who was raised in a different culture, right? So um, the kind of approach I take in, in my book is inspired by Sally Haslanger's notion of racism as a racist ideology formation. So um, for me, what matters is not just what Kant said or, or wrote, but what he said or wrote from a position of power right, mm -hmm. as um, not only a prominent philosopher, but also as a lifelong educator, right? So, and he's he had, he occupied a position of tremendous power, right? And he occupied this position within an extended, not only extended racial, oh, sorry, spatially speaking, but also extended temporally speaking. Um, you know, in an extended nexus of what I call um, nexus, uh, I call a nexus, a nexus of meaning makers and social actors, including, and this is really important to me as an educator, right, including generation after generation of impressionable students, right, who attended Kant's popular lectures on 
anthropology and geography where he repeatedly expressed some of his racist views. So that's that's what's unique about my approach. Yeah. Uh, let, let's talk about um, the 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 let's say the influence of previous scientists on on Kant's theory of race. You you sort of ex explained what 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 race means in his uh, work. So, but there were people like uh, Bacon, Francis Bacon, Boyle, uh, Buffon. Can can you talk about? how these previous scientists sort of paved the way for Kant's theory of race and uh, in what respect was his theory of race original or 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 unique, I'd say. Yeah, that's a great question. That's also a pretty complex question. So I probably... Right. Yeah, I know, so I, I probably... I'm... Yeah, go so ahead. I, you, you've written... The, the book is quite extensive and you have explained everything in quite a lot of details, which is and which makes it very easy and accessible. But I know that I'm asking a, a whole lot of like two or three chapters in one question. And the idea is to just yeah. give our listeners a broader yeah. view of uh, what the book is about. So hopefully they can yeah. go and pick up the book and read it. Yeah. Yeah, great. That's that's excellent. Um, as So I address this question in the middle chapters of the book. And actually, these chapters of the book are really dear to me as someone who's interested in philosophy of science. Mm -hmm. And so in a way, my answer to this question also builds on what I just said about my unique approach, right? So I don't just see Kant as an isolated individual, but rather I study him in relationship to others, right? So maybe I'll just first to say a little bit about my specific methodology in, in these chapters, right? So uh, when I study Kant's scientific uh, theory of race, uh, in the middle chapters of my book, I study him. I studied it as an integral part of a broader uh, racial knowledge of production and racist ideology formation process that took place during the seventeenth and seventeenth and eighteenth centuries against the backdrop of colonialism and race-based Atlantic slavery. So that bit of background is really important, right? So what do we, do I mean by, you know, say knowledge production? I would say why it's important to consider this general notion, broader notion of racial knowledge production. I'm not just talking about what Kant as an individual philosopher said about race, but I want to see how he was situated, right, in the process of racial knowledge production. So when I look at racial knowledge production, I'm thinking of a multilateral process that takes place under specific historical, social, political, and cultural conditions, and that can involve a whole network of actors. And so uh, when I look at things this way, it makes me wonder, Right, who among those actors have the power, right, to control, regulate, and significantly influence the process, right? So this is a when I think a colonialism becomes important. So um, when I look at the 17th century uh, in chapter four of the book, I was looking at philosophers' important and significant and socially well positioned. Um, powerful, right? Natural philosophers like Francis Bacon and Robert Boyle. I looked at the role they played in what I call the global data collection, right? So coordinated, it's actually coordinated global data collection about different human beings. And so this process, a, a prolonged process of global data collection about different human beings, among other different species um, of uh, things on earth. So with this process of data collection, you got this explosion of data about uh, human beings. So this eventually led Linnaeus, right, to generate this um, system of nature uh, where he kind of divide the entire human, uh, the entire humanity into four different categories uh, according to the four different continents. And this structure would eventually become Kant's um, 
uh, structure, right? Because Kant divided, just like uh, Linnaeus divided the hum humanity into four different races, even though Linnaeus himself did not yet have this you know, scientific notion of race, right? On the other hand, you also have people like Buffon, right? So by the time you got to the 18th century, you're confronted with this problem, especially as Christians who believed that all humans descended from the same ancestor, right? The same Adam and Eve. So there was this natural question as to how on earth, right, could such different human beings come from the same ancestor, right? So uh, this kind of generated this problem of what I call scientific monogenesis, namely, can you, right, how can you use scientific means to explain how the humans, how the different human uh, varieties can descend from the same origin, right? And so what makes Kant's view uh, unique was that he brought a lot of very sophisticated uh, philosophical framework to bear, right? So Kant was fascinated. I, show, I showed this in, in the book that Kant from early on, right, was a committed natural philosopher. And so as such, he was fascinated by this problem. And he was also fascinated by uh, the phenomenon that skin color, unlike other physical characteristics, is uh, persistently hereditary across all climates. So he needed to come up with this explanatory framework where he can talk about, you know, first of all, the monogenesis, secondly, the hereditary, the nature, the hereditary nature of skin color, right? So he, uh, it's not surprising that he wrote not just one, but three, right? dedicated essays on race uh, because it was a challenging project for him. And so he spent you know, three essays on race. And if you go through these essays on race, as I went through with the reader in the book, right? When you look at these essays in that progression from 1775 to 1788, you'll see that Kant became increasingly sophisticated uh, both theoretically and methodologically, all right? He was aware that he was working on something that was potentially groundbreaking and original and also controversial. He was very much aware of it, right? So maybe I should pause there. Do you want to, me to say a little bit about- It's getting more uh, and more interesting and I'm keen to know more if you have time. I know you've had a long yeah, day. Yeah, of course, so yes. Leave it up to you. <laughs> Yeah, of course. Um, I mean, I can also say specifically uh, what kind of model Kant came up with, right? So I'll, yeah. I'll just say it roughly. So the self-consciously groundbreaking model that Kant arrived at is uh, what he called epigenesis. I mean, we know the concept of genesis today, and the term was around at the time. But Kant also added a unique spin to this notion, epigenesis. And he combined it with uh, a model that used to be opposed to it called preformation. He basically combined these two models and um, he basically said, he basically came up with this model, which is a sophisticated form of uh, teleological explanation, but it leaves enough room uh, for scientific explanations. This is important to Kant, right? Because Kant does not just want to be an old fashioned Aristotelian. He wanted, to, as a naturalist philosopher, he really valued uh, leaving enough room for natural scientific explanations of things. And this was Newton's influence on him, by the way. So roughly speaking, Kant posits that there were some original germs, what he called germs, in the original human phylum or stem, which would allow the human species to survive wherever they went on earth, right? So then as ancient, ancient human beings uh, were dispersed to different parts of the earth and had to survive in different climates, uh, some of these germs 
became developed and some of the features became articulated in a way that was irre irreversible. And so some of the features became salient and other things got so called, you know, uh, crushed <laughs> in the process. And skin color was one of these adaptive features. So according to Kant, skin color, uh, a different skin color got developed and established in each of the four climate types. And that gave rise to four basic skin types. And that for him was a racial feature. And that was the basis of his fourfold uh, racial division uh, according to the four continents, right? You have white race in Europe, you have uh, yellow race in Asia, you have black race in Africa, and then you have so-called red race in America. So very neat, right? <laughs> so that's where he arrived at. But the kind of theoretical framework and theolo sorry, uh, philosoph um, methodological considerations that he brought to bear were what made his theory of race itself quite unique and quite original. Yeah. Mm. I, I think it's a perfect segue to my next question. Should you beautifully describe his, his, his theory of race, but what is the relation of that theory of race and his vision of human progress? Because race and then human progress are usually inter interrelated. Yeah. That's a great question too, and you're right. And this question builds right on the previous question. And I think mm -hmm. there there are actually two sides to this uh, relationship. So um, on the one hand, the theory of race I just described to you actually contained um, a um, to Kant brilliant <laughs> conceptual framework, right? To talk about human progress. Um, so basically Kant thinks that humanity as a species is destined to first of all, leave the state of nature and to be cultivated, civilized and eventually uh, moralized. And his epigenetic model that I described earlier, right? That uh, he developed and refined in the process of writing about race, right? The epigenetic model gives him um, the tools and the conceptual framework to say, first of all, the human species contains in it itself original germs, right? That are teleologically oriented toward moral perfection, right? Mm. And then secondly, and this is important for Kant, those germs are just like that germs, right? They are potentials. So those germs, need to be developed and they need to be developed to their destined perfection, especially moral perfection under suitable conditions and over a very, very long period of time, generation after generation and things like that, right? So that's the one side of the relationship. And the, on the other hand, Kant's racism, together with his Orientalism, I shall add, uh, you know, it's a topic you're interested in. So his racism means that only white Westerners can continue to participate in the historically extended process as agents, whereas the other races have no agential roles to play or have no roles to play at all, right? So for example, Kant claims that the race represented by the American Indians never even leaves the state of nature and is completely incapable of culture, any culture whatsoever, right? Next to the black race is only capable of what Kant calls culture of slavery. And uh, the yellow race represented by um, uh, what Kant called Hindus and Chinese is, incap is capable of culture of rudimentary arts, but not fine arts, not sciences, not philosophy, not morality, right? So this last claim about uh, the Asians um, is also behind Kant's contention that true philosophy could only have originated with the Greeks in the West, now with the East Indians, um, 
or Chinese or actually um, all so to so called Orientals, right? So you can see how this view actually is still reflected in professional philosophy today, the way we value Western philosophy, right? The way uh, the Eastern philosoph philosophical traditions often have to justify themselves as philosophy, right? You can see that there, there is Kantian origin in this practice, right? Okay. Yeah. And you're absolutely right. I read an article some time ago uh, I, I think it was called Can Non-Europeans Can Non-Europeans Think? And there was this beautiful paragraph in it that, and I live in Australia myself, so when when there is an art produced by uh, Indigenous Australians, it's called Indigenous Art, then you yeah. have, for example, ethno-philosophy, ethno-music, this is a Chinese philosophy, it's called ancient wisdom, but not really philosophy, and it oh just gosh. doesn't make sense. Like, <laughs> anything that comes from the West is philosophy proper, it's art proper. But the others need to have this modifier. And I'm from Iran myself. So you have, for example, great Islamic thinkers or Islamic theology, which is something, it is philosophy in a way. It's the same yeah. thing that, for example, the Christian philosophers in the Middle Ages were producing. But anyway, it, you're absolutely right. It need, there is a modifier as if it's not really proper philosophy or art or even science. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, as a last question, and I think it's also very topical, uh, has, I guess, even become more topical in the past three or four years that we have had, for example, movements such as Black Lives Matter and things that happened during COVID. So people have become more reflective and they're going to, uh, even academics, they're reading previous thinkers. And then there's a con controversy again in academia or in public sphere. Do we need, for example, the statue of this thinker to be here because we had some racial ideas? Yeah. So do, do you think that we can study Kant and his moral philosophy by just ignoring his racial views? How should we approach Kant? <laughs> yeah, I would say absolutely not. <laughs> so I would also say that now that my book is out, there is no excuse. <laughs> I would say, <laughs> I think at this point, it would be a professional malpractice, I would say. Yeah. to teach or study Kant's moral philosophy while simply ignoring his racial views, right? So um, let's just consider teaching first because I really care about teaching um, because I think it's when I teach, I feel this deep sense of obligation to the future generations. And I also feel this deep call for honesty with the next generations. And so given what I have shown on the basis of meticulous textual and uh, historical analysis, especially my argument in chapter one, that there is in fact no contradiction between Kant's pure moral philosophy and his racist worldview, mm -hmm. it would be, actually be dishonest to teach the formal without a non-superficial here I mean non-superficial critical engagement with the latter. Uh, what I mean is that you cannot just say, well, 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 Kant said racist things, but let's move on, right? I, I consider that superficial and insincere. Mm -hmm. And um, so at any rate, you mentioned about what the Black Lives Matter did to how we actually consume. Uh, materials from history, right? How we approach things. So I think as far as I can tell from my own teaching experience, students nowadays are not as naive, gullible, or epistemically isolated as I was, right? So many of them are already suspicious of the old Western Eurocentric canon made of white male thinkers. Right. So now if we give them a sanitized version of Kant and they find out on their own that he actually held racist views, they may get upset <laughs> that uh, we are hiding something right, as if uh, from them or that we don't trust their ability to handle the truth, so to speak. Right. I totally trust my students ability to handle it. And I think there is a lot of concern that, oh, you know, if you tell them about Kant's racist views, 
then everybody wants to cancel them. I don't think that fear mm. is well grounded. I've had so many conversations with my students. Most of those conversations are very nuanced. Um, and, um, and if students do feel angry and do want to cancel, then we, it's, it's our burden to have proper conversations with them, right? We cannot just impose any particular sanitized version on them, right? Mm -hmm. So um, that's that's teaching, right? Now let's consider what a con scholar, all right, a researcher should do. Now I'm not here suggesting that everyone should start writing about racism or Kant's relationship to, to it. But I do think we may read Kant's philosophy differently uh, when we take into account his teachings and writings on race, which are extensive, right? Um, I myself actually continue to discover new ways of interpreting Kant's philosophy since I finished this book. For example, my current work builds on the recognition that Kant held a pretty obnoxious form of uh, Orientalism. Um, and linguistic racism. I mean, he said a lot about the Oriental languages being, say, child's language <laughs> that's not suitable for culture, right? Things like that. That's a pretty obnoxious view. But I'm not interested in accusing Kant. I'm interested in using that as a starting point to reread Kant, right? So I'm right now I'm using that as as a starting point to reinterpret Kant's, uh, Kant's theory of public reason or public use of reason, which he uh, um, it articulated uh, in his famous essay on uh, the Enlightenment, right, for example. So most of, most of Kant's readers, uh, liberal-minded readers, <laughs> uh, read it as, you know, egalitarian. But the way I'm reading it now, because I start uh, by taking his racist and orientalist views uh, seriously, I actually start questioning uh, whether Kant's account of public reason is really egalitarian. So um, this is just to say that when you take Kant's racist views seriously, you actually get a very different interpretive angle and that's actually that can be very interesting, and that actually allow you to put Kant in critical conversation with what's going on right now. There are there are a lot of scholars who are working on linguistic injustice, for example, and I'm actually linking up my study of Kant's public reason with what those scholars are saying about the current world. Right, so. Mm -hmm. In short, right, and also in conclusion, I would say, as my fellow Kant scholar Andrew Cooper puts it in his recent review of my book, by the way, it's a great review. Um, now that this book has set a new benchmark, a lot of work uh, remains to be done on the part of Kantians. And I think they should embrace this as an opportunity as well as a challenge. So that's an invitation, I would say. Dr. Uh, Hua Ping, Lou Adler, thank you very, very much for taking the time to talk with us on New Books Network. Uh, the book is called uh, Kant, Race and Racism, Views from Somewhere, published by Oxford University Press in 2023. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. It's a pleasure.